Module 5, Blockchain Security and Digital Identity Lecture 1, Blockchain Honeypots In this lecture, we will cover the following topics. A short introduction to cybersecurity and information security. An introduction to honeypots. Honeypot placement and scope. Blockchain node honeypots. Blockchain application honeypots. Smart contract honeypots. This lecture is part of Module 5, Blockchain Security and Digital Identity. The main objectives of this course are to enable you to recognize and be able to discuss the key trends in computer and network security, specifically blockchain technologies. Upon completion of the course, you should be able to describe the importance of different types of honeypots for cybersecurity in general, and for blockchains in particular. You should understand the motivation for the use of node, application, and smart contract honeypots, and be able to explain the principles of their operation. To follow this course, you should understand the basics of blockchain technology architectures and operation, as well as the basic principles of smart contracts. A short introduction to cybersecurity and information security. When discussing security, two terms will often come up interchangeably, information security and cybersecurity. While the goals of both may be the same, they focus on slightly different aspects of what should be protected and how. Some initial disambiguation is important to avoid potential confusion. Information security is an established field dealing with protecting sensitive information. This involves many mechanisms, such as encryption, and was in fact done long before the advent of digital computers. One needs only to think about Caesar's cipher, an encryption mechanism already used circa 50b.c, that changes each letter of the text to a different letter a fixed number of positions down the alphabet, example, A becomes C, B becomes D, etc. Information security deals with identifying information to be protected, classifying information into categories, confidential, sensitive, public, identifying potential risks, designing and performing risk avoidance and risk mitigation strategies, i.e., physically or electronically protecting the information, and monitoring the status and success of such protections. The three core aspects of information security are confidentiality, integrity, and availability, often abbreviated as CIA. Confidentiality means that the information should not be disclosed to unauthorized persons. Integrity means that no unauthorized change should be possible. Availability deals with ensuring the information is accessible when needed. These three aspects, CIA, also remain highly relevant in the digital world, however, many new methods of attack, i.e., attack vectors, have emerged. As a result of the last decades of incessant digitalization and softwareization, not only information, but also services are moving to the digital realm, both are now electronically accessible from anywhere, and such access can be misused and abused for electronically gaining illicit access to both data breaching information security, and services, electronically performing denial-of-service attacks on both, corrupting data, preventing services from being accessed, as well as using other people and their authorization as an aid in attacking such systems. The latter significantly amplifies the reach of social engineering and human attack vectors. Since this course focuses on digital systems, powered by blockchain technology, we will focus our attention specifically on cybersecurity. In recent decades, we've witnessed a large wave of digitalization. With this term, we describe the tendency of traditionally analog, offline, purely mechanical, or paper-based systems and processes to move to more efficient computer-based systems. The benefits are obvious. The electronic systems allow the data to be entered once and processed automatically, which increases speed, worker productivity, and cuts down costs. Furthermore, the data can also be ingested into the systems automatically, through sensors, i.e., in various Internet of Things systems, it can be processed with advanced machine learning algorithms, 
and it can be acted upon through activators. Through digitalization, all aspects of our lives are slowly being upgraded to software-based internet-connected systems, smart locks, smart appliances, smart cars, smart power grids, etc. Everything from our personal lives to our work environments, as well as our most critical infrastructure, power grid, mobile networks, emergency communications, has practically overnight become susceptible to a single kind of attacker, someone with skills to compromise modern computer systems and networks. In such an environment, it has become crucial to assess the possible risks of such systems and mitigate them. Cybersecurity has emerged as an interdisciplinary field that studies all possible means of attack, attack vectors, on such digital systems, with the final goal of their mitigation and, ultimately, prevention. We emphasized the word interdisciplinary in the previous section. Indeed, few fields can compete with the broadness of cybersecurity and security in general. Today's systems consist of extremely varied building blocks, software layers are stacked miles high and can be constantly in flux, updating with every feature or detected vulnerability. There are numerous hidden dependencies and complex supply chains. This makes the job of modern software architects, developers, and sysadmins much harder. Similarly, networks are becoming complex and software-defined, meaning they can also reconfigure without explicit human intervention. Then there's cryptography, the math-based science of concealing information, new approaches are constantly being developed and old ones deprecated due to newfound weaknesses or inability to resist the increases in computer power and new computing paradigms such as quantum computing. All of these systems include active users in all parts of the system from developers and system administrators to end users. Users are human, with all of the human weaknesses, to err is human, normalization of deviance, susceptibility to online or offline fraud and social engineering attempts, targeted phishing attacks, i.e., spear phishing, etc. This all ties in with economics and business processes, software needs to be designed and developed, and usually someone needs to pay for that. Security in general is invisible to the users, is rarely demanded as a feature, but has a significant development and maintenance cost. Business entities need to balance the cost of security with the cost of a compromised system, i.e., penalties, negative publicity, etc., to remain competitive. Finally, there are legal aspects to be considered, both from the perspective of the software developers and service providers as well as from the perspective of the end users. Decentralized apps are extremely complex systems with several moving parts. Firstly, there are the nodes that communicate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, comprising a system of a distributed nature. The nodes themselves are just servers, running an operating system and an application in user space. This means that they are vulnerable to any kind of generalized OS-level attack, denial-of-service attack, or application-specific attack. There is a distributed consensus mechanism running on top of these nodes, which is usually developed by a highly skilled core team and battle-tested in real life, so it is deemed reasonably secure for most blockchain platforms. We will thus assume there are no glaring security issues in the consensus mechanism, however in reality this need not be the case, the core team could do a poor job, or an exploit could be discovered in even the most vetted platforms. Secondly, there are smart contracts, written on top of the blockchain platform. These can contain unvetted user code, which means there are no guarantees about their correctness or reliability. Indeed, many real-world incidents and hacks prove that it is a popular and easy-to-exploit attack vector. Finally, applications for end-users need to link these components together and facilitate some user-friendly mode of interaction, for example, present a graphical user interface, APIs for dedicated hardware, or similar. All these building blocks are usually developed with different technologies and rely on different paradigms. That means they can also contain independent exploits and attack vectors. 
since the attackers will usually follow the path of least resistance and exploit the weakest links first, all of the subparts will need to be adequately secured. Cyber threat intelligence is critical to adequately securing any system. Possible threats, their impact, and their probability should be taken into account in order to create an effective security strategy. Cyber threats come in many forms, from viruses and malware to phishing attacks and denial of service, DOS attacks. The consequences of a successful cyber attack can be devastating, ranging from loss of data to financial damage to reputational damage. In order to create an effective security strategy, it is important to understand the different types of cyber threats and their potential impact. Cyber threat intelligence can help organizations identify possible threats and assess their likelihood of occurring. By understanding the risks, organizations can take steps to protect themselves and their systems. Many complementing data sources are typically used for cyber threat intelligence, including human intelligence, social media information, forensically acquired data, darknet sensors, etc. Human intelligence can provide valuable insights into the motivations and methods of potential attackers, while social media can be a useful tool for identifying potential targets. Forensically acquired data can give investigators a detailed picture of how an attack was carried out, and darknet sensors can help to identify new and emerging threats. By using all of these data sources, security professionals can get a better understanding of the threats they face and the best ways to protect their systems. A particularly important source of threat intelligence data are honeypots. Introduction to Honeypots Honeypots are a particularly important source of threat intelligence data. A honeypot is a mechanism that is set up to attract and entice potential hackers so that they can be monitored and studied. By luring hackers into a trap, honeypots can be used to gather information about new hacking techniques, vulnerabilities, and malware. This information can then be used to better secure systems and protect against future attacks. At the same time, honeypots can also be used to deflect or counter the unauthorized use of information systems. By providing a low-resistance lightning rod for attackers, they consume the time of the attackers and drive them away from valuable resources. However, all of this relies on the faithfulness of the honeypot system. If the honeypot is unconvincing or poorly designed, it will not serve that purpose. Honeypots can be classified into several groups based on their design choices, the purpose of use, types of resources mimicked, or other properties. The level of interaction describes how engaging, interactive, and thus convincing the honeypot is. The interaction in this context means how varied the inputs and responses of the honeypot are. Low interaction honeypots are, in a sense, only a facade that can be obtained by a crude simulation of the resource. Thus, these honeypots are not very convincing to attackers, due to their limited responses. On the other hand, low-interaction honeypots are easy to deploy and manage. They are still useful to collect attack data, such as IP addresses, network traffic, or malware samples. High-interaction honeypots are the most interactive and convincing type of honeypots. They are designed to mimic real systems as accurately as possible and are thus also the most difficult to deploy and manage. To get the highest level of interaction, they need to be in many cases deployed as pure honeypots, i.e., real systems that serve no other purpose but to observe and monitor the actions of the attackers. Based on the primary intention, we can distinguish between production honeypots and research honeypots. Production honeypots are intended to support the security of an organization's network by detecting attacks and collecting information about them to help harden the organization's security posture. Research honeypots are intended for research purposes such as studying the behavior of attackers and understanding the tools and techniques they use. Based on the type of resource offered, we distinguish the following types of honeypots, information, service, or pure computing resources, CPU, memory, storage. 
Information honeypots offer apparently valuable information, such as databases of users or credit cards. Service-oriented honeypots are designed to emulate a service and then intercept all requests to the service and collect information on attackers. The most common types of service honeypots are Telnet slash SSH or Web honeypots. Finally, computing resources honeypots are designed to simulate raw resources, such as virtual machines with different configurations. Based on the type of technology there are multiple options, most services can be offered through specialized protocols such as SSH, Telnet, specific HTTP API endpoints, websites disclosing information, etc. Larger systems comprised of multiple honeypots are called honeynets. Let's look at an example of a honeypot for a popular service for remotely accessing Linux systems, the Secure Shell. Secure Shell allows users to connect to a remote computer and execute commands on that computer. The Secure Shell honeypot would thus allow an attacker to connect to the honeypot and execute commands, but would not allow them to access any sensitive information or pivot to other systems. This would give the honeypot operator some information about the attacker, such as the IP address they are connecting from, the commands they are executing, and any files they might be transferring. As an example, one can use the open source project Cowrie, which is a low interaction SSH honeypot. Cowrie is written in Python and captures all interaction with the honeypot and stores it in a database for later analysis. However, Cowrie's simplicity makes many everyday tasks infeasible. Having only rudimentary functionality, the attacker cannot execute their own programs which significantly reduces the utility of this type of honeypot for detecting more advanced types of attack mechanisms. Honeypot Placement and Scope The figure represents the main components of the blockchain stack, spanning from the infrastructure layer at the bottom to the application layer at the top. Some components are drawn in green, these are usually well designed and heavily scrutinized and tested and thus less vulnerable to attacks. On the other hand, multiple components are depicted in orange, these will often receive less attention or provide more room for exploitable mistakes. The infrastructure layer comprises actual resources used to run the blockchain network and apps. At the lowest level, this means physical servers and network elements. Some form of virtualization is often used to improve the efficiency of resource use and an operating system is used to provide the foundation for all of the software on the higher levels. Physical servers and virtualization software are mature and robust technologies with little room for misconfiguration, while the operating system and network elements both expose a huge attack surface and can, when misconfigured, compromise the entire stack. The main component of the blockchain network and protocol layer is the node software that implements the consensus algorithm and any of the required interoperability with various side chains. Node software itself, together with the implementation of the consensus algorithm, is often well tested and reviewed, however, the final configuration can be inadequate from a security standpoint. On the services layer, there is a virtual machine, VM. For the execution of smart contracts, this is robust and well-tested. However, smart contracts are basically unvetted user code and have been a popular attack vector that has already led to many disastrous hacks, including the Ethereum DAO hack in 2016. And finally, on the application layer, there is the application logic provided by an external party, Similarly unvetted and potentially unprofessionally developed code that can prove to be a much easier attack vector than any of the underlying infrastructure. As shown in the figure, honeypots can be used at all of the layers of the blockchain stack. While on the lowest layer we are talking about classical OS level and network level honeypots, Telnet, SSH, database honeypots, that are not blockchain specific such as the Cowrie SSH honeypot mentioned before, other layers will need a dedicated custom-made honeypot mechanism. 
For this reason, we will individually address the blockchain nodes and their potential attack vectors, applications, and finally, smart contracts and their exploitability. Blockchain Node Honeypots Blockchain platforms are complex distributed and decentralized systems that consist of individual building blocks, blockchain nodes. These nodes are autonomous and communicate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, without a central authority. This makes such systems incredibly robust since a majority of nodes need to be compromised for the overall emergent consensus to be compromised. However, like peers in a group, an individual can still be targeted in an attack and be compromised for financial or other types of gains, without compromising the entire community. A blockchain node is in fact nothing more than software, running on a computer system, commonly, a server. This software has a predefined script, mandating how to communicate with peers, how to execute the instructions on the virtual machine powering smart contracts, and how to participate in reaching the network consensus. To function, a node needs to have enough available resources, compute, memory, storage, network, connectivity, and sufficient bandwidth, etc., and reducing or removing these resources can incapacitate the node. Finally, nodes will often also provide connectivity with applications through APIs, ensuring that the state of the network and smart contracts can be read or changed in accordance with the needs of the application or user scenario. Compromising an individual node comes down to either removing the necessary resources for the node to function, denial of service, or finding and exploiting misconfigurations or bugs on the entire stack of software the node is using, from the operating system to the actual node software and its APIs. Since the node needs CPU resources, consuming the available CPU power of the server will largely incapacitate the node. Similarly, exhausting the system memory and disk space will not only incapacitate the node but the entire system. All of these tasks can be achieved through side effects, example, spamming the node with bogus requests that consume the CPU power or generate copious amounts of error logs by performing a certain action, example, regular or irregular API requests, SSH login attempts, etc. Next, the node communication can be disrupted, effectively disconnecting it from the network. This can be done either by saturating the network interfaces with useless traffic or sending specially crafted reset packets to disrupt existing sessions. All of these options are basically a denial-of-service attack, DOS, or a distributed DOS if performed from multiple points at once. Next, there is a possibility that the node software has bugs and vulnerabilities, possible exploitation paths. These will often be reported to vulnerability databases when discovered and can as such be quickly reused by attackers. Other attack vectors include for example, the API fuzzing methods, a guessing game, to change API endpoints, or craft problematic API payloads that break the message parser. Last, but not least, the largest potential security hole is human error. The node software can have unsafe defaults that the users forget to change. The remote access password to the server's operating system can be trivial to guess, etc. Any of these and more options can let the attackers gain access to the entire machine, obtain any passwords stored in configuration files, and potentially even extract private keys used to sign transactions. To set up a honeypot, there are a number of things to observe, some of these will depend on your intentions and the foreseen purpose of the honeypot. It needs to be accessible. It needs to have sufficiently credible, but weak protections, to allow attackers to log in. It should provide sufficient incentives for the attackers. It must be convincing enough to keep the attackers engaged. For example, to make the honeypot accessible to attackers, there are multiple strategies. When mimicking a public facing service, you can consider setting up the honeypot on a public non firewalled IP address. If your main focus is detecting possible breaches of your network, a honeypot on a private IP address can also provide such tripwire functionality and catch possible lateral movement in your network. 
In addition to ensuring connectivity, the honeypot should also provide a sufficiently weakened authentication mechanism, such as weak credentials of allowing access after a certain number of login attempts, regardless of the credentials used. Depending on your purpose, you should keep in mind both your goals and the attacker's incentives. For research honeypots where the amount and quality of data that you gather is your primary reason, you should prioritize the accessibility and discoverability of the honeypot. It can also make sense to allow some flexibility regarding the tech stack to leverage a bigger pool of possible attackers. On the other hand, for production honeypots aimed at increasing the security of networks and systems, you should maximize the fit with your security infrastructure and aim at collecting the right kinds of indicators that you can reuse with your intrusion detection systems. To get the most out of it, it should probably be set up with a similar tech stack like your production systems. In the extreme, this will likely be a pure honeypot that replicates your production system with its entire attack surface. When developing and deploying a specific type of blockchain node honeypot, you will need to consider the attack vectors of the blockchain node that you wish to target. If your main intention is risk assessment and observing the prevalence of threats, the minimum amount of attacker data, source IP address, user agent string, other request metadata, will suffice. For this, simple rule-based low-interaction honeypots are good enough, with the request response rules defined based on the common interaction patterns. To get a more comprehensive interface coverage, a live node can be scraped in advance, and responses simply replayed when the attacker issues requests. This will give an impression of much more comprehensive API coverage, with all of the requests receiving technically valid, yet stale or logically invalid, responses. For best results, proxying the traffic to a real live node can be considered, with some filtering applied to limit any destructive operations. Another alternative to such filtering is running a modified node that limits the potential damage caused by the attackers. Blockchain Application Honeypots The application further extends the blockchain platform and its services, and thus adds several possible points of attack. The figure shows the network of the blockchain platform in the center, using peer-to-peer -peer communication mechanisms to allow the nodes to communicate. Two applications are connected to the network at separate nodes, each application consists of a back-end server that facilitates communication with the blockchain platform and its smart contracts. In some cases, the backend server will also feature a hot wallet, dashed, for performing transactions on behalf of lightweight application frontends, web apps or mobile apps without their own wallet. In other cases, the wallet will be linked with the frontend app, example, MetaMask. In Internet of Things scenarios, hardware components can also talk directly to the backend. When compared to the heavily scrutinized and vetted core network nodes and consensus algorithms, apps will typically be much smaller projects, developed by smaller and less experienced teams. Apps tend to start as proofs of concept or prototypes, where security is of secondary importance. Furthermore, such complex systems are hard to test and change often, usually without a formal process that would ensure good security practices. This provides a path of least resistance for attackers and maximizes the likelihood they will start with the app to get the best cost-slash-benefit ratio. Luckily, any actual exploits will be extremely specific, tailored to the app, and often won't generalize to other systems. Some of the common application attack vectors are the following. Exploiting the app logic through the API. This also includes URL guessing and API parameter modifications, often termed API fuzzing. Performing SQL injection attacks to dump or modify the data in the app's database, this is usually achieved through input parameters that are either available as web forms, usernames, passwords, etc., or through API parameters. Gaining access to the server through compromising other exposed services, any service running on the server can through misconfiguration or vulnerability, lead to the entire server getting compromised. 
The backend servers can be incapacitated by performing various kinds of denial of service, either saturating the network interfaces with traffic or performing actions that result in the exhaustion of other resources, consuming the system memory, CPU, or disk space. Performing user assisted attacks, such as cross site scripting, XSS. Each of these and other application attack vectors will require a focused honeypot approach as well as its own mitigations. Smart Contract Honeypots Ethereum and other modern blockchains allow the execution of smart contracts. Smart contracts are programs that are executed across a decentralized network. In the case of Ethereum, programs are stored and executed via the Ethereum Virtual Machine, EVM. Transactions are used to deploy, invoke, and remove smart contracts from the blockchain. The main difference from traditional programs is that smart contracts are immutable. So any transaction or mistake becomes irreversible. The smart contracts are written in a high-level language, called Solidity, which compiles into EVM bytecode. The Ethereum network has grown exponentially in the last few years and has become more valuable. The network becomes an interesting target for attackers, who become incentivized to find and exploit vulnerable contracts. In the past few years, several smart contracts have been exploited by attackers. The best known examples are The Poly Network Hack, $611 million Ronin Sidechain Hack, $552 million Compound Hack, $150 million Smart contracts become a prime target for attackers for the following reasons. Finality of transactions, once the transaction takes place, it can't be reverted. This is great for an attacker targeting smart contracts since a successful attack cannot be undone. Monetizing successful attacks is straightforward, once the funds of a smart contract can be withdrawn by the attacker. Exchanging the funds can be done anonymously if the attacker is careful enough. Availability of contract source code. Many blockchains are public, so the code of a smart contract is available to anyone. Availability of scanning tools. Search for potential targets using smart contract vulnerability scanners can be automated. This lecture will look at how cybersecurity experts can use smart contract honeypots to deploy a seemingly vulnerable contract and place bait for attackers. However, there is a trend where attackers do not search for vulnerable contracts anymore, but instead use smart contract honeypots to lure their victims into traps. Like other types of fraud, honeypots work because human beings are often easily manipulated. People are not always capable of quantifying risk against their greed and presumptions. A smart contract honeypot is a smart contract that pretends to leak its funds to an arbitrary user if that user sends additional funds to it. The user definition depends on the deployment scenario and can be an attacker or a victim. The funds the user provides will be locked in the smart contract, and the honeypot creator can retrieve them. The withdrawal of the funds depends on the motivation of the honeypot creator. An attacker would collect the funds, but a cybersecurity expert would leave the funds in the smart contract. The main idea is that the user solely focuses on the apparent vulnerability and does not consider the possibility that a second vulnerability might be hidden in the contract. The main steps of a smart contract honeypot deployed by a cybersecurity expert. One. The cybersecurity expert deploys a seemingly vulnerable contract with some funds as bait. 2. The attacker attempts to exploit the contract by transferring at least the required amount of funds and fails. 3. The funds remain locked in the smart contract, and the attacker loses the funds in the attempt of exploitation. Smart contract honeypots can be divided into three main categories depending on the techniques used and the level at which they operate. Ethereum Virtual Machine EVM, based smart contract honeypots. Solidity Compiler-based smart contract honeypots. Etherscan-based smart contract honeypots. 
As explained, the main idea of a smart contract honeypot is to hide the honeypot behavior from users and trick them into sending funds due to vulnerability exploitation. Ethereum Virtual Machine EVM, based smart contract honeypots The first smart contract honeypot category is based on how the EVM instruction is executed. The EVM follows a strict and publicly known set of rules, but there still can be unusual behavior that requires a very good experience with how EVM works. The users can be misled or confused by fraudulent smart contract implementations. Solidity Compiler-Based Smart Contract Honeypots The second category of smart contract honeypot is related to issues introduced by the Solidity Compiler. Some compiler issues might go unnoticed if a user does not analyze the smart contract carefully or test it under real-world conditions. In other words, the smart contract honeypot builder should have a good experience with smart contract development and a deep understanding of how the Solidity compiler would work. For example, the way inherence is managed by each version of the Solidity compiler or when overriding variables or parameters would happen. Etherscan Blockchain Explorer The third category of smart contract honeypot is based on hiding things from the users. It can be done by limiting the information displayed on Etherscan's website. Etherscan is perhaps the most prominent Ethereum blockchain explorer, and many users trust the website data. Balance Disorder Honeypot the Balance Disorder Honeypot is an EVM-based smart contract honeypot. The following smart contract example makes use of a Balance Disorder Honeypot. Every smart contract in Ethereum possesses a balance. The multiplicate function suggests that the balance of the contract, this, dot balance, and the value included in the transaction to this function call, message value, are transferred to an arbitrary user address if the caller of this function includes a value that is higher than or equal to the current balance of the smart contract. A naive user will believe that all they need to do is to call this function with a value higher or equal to the current balance and that, in return, they will obtain the invested value plus the balance contained in the contract. However, what a user could miss in this quick smart contract analysis is that the contract balance will be increment as soon as the user performs the function call. The message value will always be lower than the contract balance, no matter what you do. Therefore, the condition will never be true, and the contract will be locked in this contract. It is worth noting that. The condition at line 4 can be satisfied if the current balance of the contract is zero, but then the user does not have the incentive to exploit the contract. The addition of this dot balance plus message value solely makes the user further believe that the balance is updated only after the execution. 2.1.1.5 Uninitialized Struct Honeypot the uninitialized structure is a common problem in Solidity and could be seen as a vulnerability and a way to trick users. Solidity provides means to define new data types in the form of structs. They combine several named variables under one variable and are the foundation for more complex data structures in Solidity. A smart contract example of an uninitialized struct honeypot is given in the following example. An uninitialized structure problem happens when a structure variable is not initialized at its creation. When a structure variable is not initialized in the same line as its creation with the keyword new, the Solidity compiler point that variable to the first slot of the smart contract. The variable will be pointing to the first variable of the smart contract. Once the developer starts affecting values to the structure variable, the first element value of the structure will overwrite the first variable value. For a user to withdraw the contract's balance, the contract requires placing a bet and guessing a random number stored in the contract. Any user can easily obtain the value of the random number since every data stored on the blockchain is publicly available. The following steps explain how a user can lose the funds. The first thought suggests that the contract creator made a common mistake by assuming that variables declared as private are secret. 
An innocent user reads the random number from the blockchain and calls the function guess number by placing a bet and providing the correct number. The contract creates a struct that seems to track the user's participation. The struct is not properly initialized via the new keyword. The Solidity compiler maps the storage location of the first variable contained in the struct, player, to the storage location of the first variable contained in the contract, random number, thereby overriding the random number with the address of the caller and thus making the condition, underscore number equals equals random number, fail. The user could bypass the honeypot by guessing the overwritten value, the user address. The creator can drastically reduce the chances of the user generating the same address by limiting the number to between 1 and 10. There are a lot of different tools that allow scanning contracts for vulnerabilities before deploying them on the blockchain. Unfortunately, attackers may also use these tools to find vulnerable contracts and exploit them easily. One such tool is Honey Badger, which helps detect honeypots in Ethereum smart contracts. The main way to recognize a smart contract honeypot is by examining the contract transaction behavior. Lots of attackers are adopting a more proactive strategy. They aim to trick their victims into falling into traps by sending out contracts that appear vulnerable but contain hidden traps, smart contract honeypot. Only the honeypot creator, in this case an attacker, can recover the funds. You can protect yourself by checking if the contract has been audited and checking its transaction history. Thank you for listening to this lecture.